Good morning, members of the audience and special guests. Before we begin the proceedings and on behalf of all those present, I'd like to acknowledge this webinar is hosted on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would also like to pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. This session will now be recorded. We will record audio, screen share and our presenters. We will not be recording any video or input from the audience. Welcome to all UTS students, staff, and all friends of ACRI and UTS. My name is Amy, and I'm the Communications Officer at the Australia-China Relations Institute at the, Australia, at the University of Technology, Sydney. UTS ACRI is an, is an independent, non-partisan research institute established in 2014 by the University of Technology, Sydney. Chinese centres exist in other Australian universities. UTS ACRI, however, is Australia's first and only research institute devoted to studying the relationship of these countries. UTS ACRI seeks to inform Australia's engagement with China through research, analysis, and dialogue grounded in scholarly rigour. If you wanted to explore more about the Australia-China relationship, more details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org. Today, we launched the book, The Xinjiang Emergency, edited by UTS ACRI adjunct professor Michael Clark, in which some of the world's top scholars on Uyghur history, culture, politics, and identity provide a detailed examination of the long-term causes and consequences of Beijing's repression in Xinjiang. It is available for purchase at manchesteruniversitypress.co.uk and all good bookstores. Dr. David Brophy, Senior Lecturer on Modern Chinese History at the University of Sydney, will be moderating this discussion. Audience questions are welcome at the end, so please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A tab along the bottom panel of this Zoom webinar. Now a little bit about the speaker. Michael Clark is a UTS ACRI adjunct professor and a senior fellow at the Center for Defense Research at the Australian Defense College. His major areas of research and publication include the history and politics of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, People's Republic of China, Chinese foreign and security policy, American Grand Strategy and Nuclear Proliferation and Non-Proliferation. Our moderator for today's discussion is Dr. David Brophy, Senior Lecturer on Modern Chinese History at the University of Sydney. He is the author of the book Uyghur Nation and is a frequent commentator on the Xinjiang crisis in outlets including AP News, South China Morning Post and ABC News. Last year, Dr. Brophy also published a book on Australia-China relations called China Panic, Australia's Alternative to Paranoia and Pandering. I will now hand it over to Dr. David Brophy to begin today's discussion. Uh, thanks very much, Amy. Uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome to colleagues and friends. Uh, we're um, well above 70 now in the, uh, in the audience, which is, which is fantastic. A book launch is usually a happy occasion, uh, of course, but we're here to discuss a book <clears throat> analyzing a very sad, uh, very disturbing topic, the, uh, the ongoing repression uh, in Xinjiang, the beginnings of which we generally date to mid to late 2017, uh, and which is still impacting communities there in, in a very serious way. Uh, now, there's been no shortage of things to read on this situation, uh, a lot of reports, uh, think tank analysis, uh, lots of journalism, uh, of course, but I think it's fair to say that this is really the first substantial academic work, you know, 300 plus pages here of scholarly analysis uh, of a high standard, there's a lot of topics discussed here that, that generally don't find space uh, in the news cycle and discussed at length. Uh, so, so first of all, um, hearty congratulations to Michael uh, on this book. Uh, not just the book, but the work involved in uh, convening this group, uh, editing and pushing the book through to, to publication. We all know that that's not a, uh, that's not a small task. Um, so um, congratulations to Michael and, of course, congratulations to any of the, uh, the other contributors uh, who might be uh, joining us today. I'll, I'll just say a few words about what's in the book um, and then we will move to a discussion uh, between uh, Michael and myself. Uh, there, is, uh, there is history uh, in this book. There is a, um, it opens with a, a chapter by Sandrine Catrice reflecting on past political campaigns uh, in Xinjiang in the 1950s and the Cultural Revolution, uh, reflecting on those as, uh, as precedents, points of comparison for what has been happening in the last uh, four to five years. Uh, Anna Hayes uh, from uh, Queensland has a discussion of the, uh, the re redevelopment of Kashgar 
which if anyone has visited Kashgar since uh, 2009, which I think is when that, uh, that campaign uh, began, you'd be familiar with the, um, the remodeling of, of old Kashgar. The discussion there is of that campaign as a warning sign about what was to, uh, what was to come uh, a decade later. Um, Sean Roberts' contribution, uh, and indeed Michael's own, uh, trace the evolution uh, of policy on issues like counterterrorism, the emergence of what people now refer to as the, the Xinjiang model uh, of counterterrorism. Uh, there is other contributions that have a political focus. The, the book ends with a discussion from an international relations uh, perspective. Uh, David Tobin's piece on the uh, the, the interconnections of domestic ethnic politics uh, in China today and China's revisionist view uh, of international uh, relations. Of course, there's a lot of discussion about the, um, um, the more concrete uh, practices that have been applied um, in the course of this campaign. There's um, uh, Latrobe's James Leibold uh, and Tim Gross collaborated uh, on a chapter that uh, looks at the party's policing of social deviance the, uh, the use of pathologizing uh, medical language uh, surrounding the, uh, the detention camps and the curriculum uh, within those camps. Uh, Darren Byler, uh, an anthropologist from the US, um, his chapter I, is, um, offers a really, I think, valuable uh, perspective. It's based in fact on interviews with contractors who were brought into uh, the camp system, uh, who talk about their experience of uh, at, working in these camps, um, teaching uh, in, this, uh, in this system. There is discussion of what's going on outside the camps as well, of course, um, <clears throat> in the education sphere, uh, Joanne Smith-Finley and uh, her collaborator, Dilmarat Mahmoud, looking at a uh, question of uh, primary education and textbooks in, uh, in Xinjiang since the, the onset of this campaign. There's been a little bit of publicity about some rather high profile uh, arrests and sentences that were given to uh, Uyghur uh, writers and editors around a series of textbooks uh, that had gone through the approval process but were subsequently deemed to be um, containing, um, uh, from the party's point of view, dangerous messaging. This chapter interestingly discusses what has taken the place of that material uh, since, that, um, since that particular uh, crackdown and uh, arrest and sentencing of those uh, intellectuals, the, the signification of uh, Uyghur language uh, education in, uh, in, uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, there's a chapter on, uh, on bodies, uh, on uh, forms of medical testing uh, by Matthew Robertson, uh, which is set, set within a wider discussion um, across China of the, the controversial question of organ harvesting, not presenting evidence for that, but asking us to uh, consider the possibility um, that that might be taking place. Then uh, the final contribution uh, is from uh, the Uyghur scholar Abdelbet Baki El Trish, uh, which is about this, the emotional and psychological impact that this is all having uh, on the Uyghur diaspora. Um, and that is, uh, that particular chapter is very, uh, very tough reading. So this is a major issue. Uh, still in the contemporary discussion of China. Uh, people here, I'm sure, are coming at it from uh, various directions, various levels of knowledge. I'm sure you'll all find something new uh, and enlightening here. So I do uh, encourage you all to, to get hold of uh, a copy of this. Congratulations again to Michael and to the uh, other contributors. So I'm going to, as I said, talk to Michael uh, for a few minutes now. We're not going to take up all the time, though. So um, if you do have particular questions you'd like to ask, things that you think uh, we've missed, then please do click uh, on the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, and enter your question. Um, we can't facilitate people uh, asking questions directly, um, but we will definitely try to um, do our best to get through uh, as many of those questions as we can um, in the... Um, in the second half hour of this uh, of this discussion. So um, with that, by way of introduction, I'm gonna begin by um, taking us slightly away from the book um, actually, but asking a couple of questions that I think people coming to this discussion today are probably interested to, to hear your thoughts on. Michael, 
between the time that you produced this book and you, you sent it off um, and today, can you bring people up to, up to date um, in terms of how you see the situation uh, as it stands in, uh, in Xinjiang right now to the extent that we can, um, we can talk about um, that? And then this is sort of even, you know, looking into the future already, but again, it's probably on people's minds. You're a scholar of IR. Do you, you know, has, we're all thinking about the Ukraine crisis in the last few days. How have you, have you seen that, um, you know, or do you see that as likely to influence the, you know, either the perspective of Beijing on what's taking place in Xinjiang or the, the international discussion uh, around this issue? I know this is something that uh, I've seen um, Uyghur organisations talk about uh, as well in the last couple of days. Um, so maybe we'll start, uh, we'll start there. Sure, great. Thanks, David. And thanks for that sort of very kind introduction uh, and introduction of the main sort of themes and contributions of the book. Um, so I suppose to direct myself to that sort of first question about, you know, where things stand now and how, the situ how we might see the situation now in Xinjiang, I think there's kind of three um, main issues uh, that sort of stand out anyway from my perspective. Um, and the first is the, the fact that mass detention in various forms is still ongoing, but it's also ongoing with increased rates of imprisonment of people that have been detained. So what's interesting here is um, certainly since the time that uh, the contributions to the book were written and then obviously uh, pushed through the production process that we've seen some changes particularly around this notion um, that the Chinese state talks about individuals being so-called graduated out of the re-education system and thinking about what that actually what that actually means on the ground. Um, so we've actually seen this interconnection with uh, detention, imprisonment, but also uh, the issue of coerced or forced labour as well that's been repeated, oh, sorry, not repeated, been reported quite extensively in, in international uh, media. What's interesting as well is that while um, the detention facilities are still operating, we've also seen an adaptation of some of those facilities over time as well, shifting to, to new functions. So some becoming sort of pre-trial detention facilities for people who are being funneled into um, the, the regular prison system in Xinjiang and other facilities being uh, transformed into other facilities that are still attached to the re-education process. Um, mainly around this issue of, of forced or coerced labour, so creating some of these facilities into, I suppose, workshops or, or factories of, of, of various, various kinds. The second main theme that stands out to me is um, the fact that there's the continuation of or, or the continued operation of uh, what we might term the surveillance state in Xinjiang, because this is really what happens outside of the detention or re-education system. And again, this has been very heavily documented uh, and a number of the contributions to the book also focus a little bit on this and in my own uh, contribution around this issue of the Xinjiang model of counterterrorism in particular, the role of surveillance figures, figures pretty heavily. Um, yet much of that system, of course, remains in place uh, and in fact continues to be developed uh, in, in new ways. So that's really the second major theme that stands out. Finally, the, the, the third thing that stands out for me is really the nature in which the, the international context in which um, the, the controversy around what's happening in Xinjiang is, take, is taking place has changed significantly um, over the last few years. Um, and of course, I think we're all fairly familiar with, with some of those changes. You know, one is really the increased visibility and indeed the intense visibility of reporting on Xinjiang and international media uh, over the last number of years, an increase in uh, the concern of foreign governments uh, around the world in what's happening in Xinjiang and desire to uh, either sanction or condemn Beijing for particular actions there. Um, third, and of course, this really overlays much of this, is this sort of speculation uh, and rhetoric about a so-called new Cold War between China and, and the United States, in which the issues are around what's happening in Xinjiang have really become, I suppose, a rhetorical cudgel 
um, with which both Beijing and Washington can, can kind of hammer each other with um, at various points. So those really seem to me to be the sort of standout issues in the way in which things have changed, but also key continuities um, since, since the book, uh, so the major contributions of the book were written. Uh, in terms of the second question about Ukraine and what perhaps might be the, the implications of that for, this, for uh, these issues around Xinjiang, I mean, this is, a, I think, a really interesting question. Um, I think one important implication, certainly if we're thinking from the Chinese perspective, is the way in which um, uh, the, the Russian government, and Vladimir Putin in particular, has used... Um, you know, whether we believe him or take his claims at face value or not, um, but use this kind of rhetorical justification for the protection of uh, Russian speakers uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, as a justification for really an attempt to, to redraw um, Ukraine's territorial boundaries uh, by force, um, I think certainly would make Beijing uh, uncomfortable, um, given the fact that uh, various other episodes in, in recent history along those lines have been viewed in that way in Beijing. Certainly concerns about, uh, long-term concerns about uh, separatism uh, in Xinjiang loom pretty large and really frame some of that background history uh, to the campaign of mass repression that, that has been the subject of, of, of the book. So I think in that sense, China would be very... Um, certainly have some level of concern there uh, on that particular issue. In terms of the international community more broadly, I think um, the impact, uh, and this is not directly related to Xinjiang, but certainly I think what's happening in Ukraine and Putin's adventurism um, will in some ways, I think, inevitably um, inform uh, certainly the US and other Western states' responses to what they perceive to be Beijing's uh, revisionism in Asia, uh, whether that's with respect to the South China Sea or more particularly with respect to Taiwan. So I think there's this kind of a demonstration effect here in play um, that will not necessarily be to China's China's advantage in terms of its relationships, certainly with the United States. Um, I should dig into the book, I think, a, a little bit. I, I don't want to sort of pick apart individual chapters though, but you know, your experience of editing this, this diverse collection will I think give you a pretty good overview of um, the ways in which people are coming at this question. So I'm gonna ask quite a broad question about framing this mm. issue. And I'm gonna use a couple of oppositions here. And I don't mean to say that, you know, the correct answer is an either or, um, it's probably a mixture of, of these things, but just, you know, the emphasis does tend to vary in terms of the way people talk about these issues. One of, one of them is to, you know, sort of the particularizing emphasis on Chinese history that this reflects, you know, continuation of practices that are specific, something specific to political history of China, um, be that since PRC or even, even earlier, um, other people are reaching for more universalizing terminology, that this is an instance of something we could call settler colonialism or something like that, that we're familiar with from elsewhere. So that's one sort of binary. And the other one is, and this can sometimes get a little bit controversial. I, I don't think it necessarily needs to, but that, you know, the, the security framing versus the, versus the human rights framing, you know, that sometimes it, it's felt that if, if you put too much emphasis on security considerations as motivation for what the party is doing, that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're making concessions to um, the logic behind this, that, you know, that, that really this is, is not about terrorism, counterterrorism at all. This is um, coming from a very different direction that reflects other priorities um, that, that Beijing has always had in relation to the Uyghurs or this territory or, or something like that. So can you talk about that, that big space um, in which these, sorts of um, different ways of um, coming at this question are, are playing out at the moment and in the book uh, as well, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. Um, so I think really, certainly from my perspective, but also 
from you know a close uh, reading of of the con various contributors and and some uh, you know discussion back and forth amongst ourselves within within the group about some of these issues, I think there's really sort of an intersection of three kind of themes here um, that is is common um, to to most of the contributions in the book, and, and you've touched upon a couple of these these already. You know, one is um, that particularist uh, history uh, of the relationship between what is now known as Xinjiang and, and Chinese-based uh, polities, you know, over, over a long period of time, certainly since the, the late Qing period onwards, and how that's been shaped by particular, particular factors, um, you know, state building imperatives uh, and so on, particularly uh, under the PRC. Second core theme, and again, it's one that you touched on, is that broader conceptualization of how this fits uh, within a global history of colonialism and settler colonialism. And, you know, Sean Roberts' um, contribution touches on that quite extensively, and I do uh, too in my sort of introductory uh, sort of framing chapter uh, to the book. But there are, there's, there's another couple of themes as well that interact here and I think that are important. One we might frame is, is being concerned primarily with um, ideology, uh, and in particular, perhaps themes about totalitarianism uh, and the ideological legacies of Maoism, but also reaching back further, perhaps uh, Stalinism as well, and how this may inform certainly aspects of re-education sort of writ large in, in the Xinjiang context. And the final theme, and this is something, um, again, that I touch on in my chapter, but so do a number of other uh, contributors, is the way in which all of those other themes that I've touch, touch, touch on, touched on that are very particular to the Chinese context um, have interacted with the discourse and practices of the war on terrorism uh, since 2001. Certainly the ways in which particular discourses around counterterrorism or so-called counter-radicalisation strategies um, have played into the development of the so-called Xinjiang model um, that we've seen uh, play out over the last last few years. So it, it really is a very complex set of, of themes and sort of picking apart the ways in which they specifically interact in Xinjiang is, I think, um, you know, something that a number of contributors in the book attempt, um, but we don't, we certainly none of us claim to have kind of a definitive answer as to the way in which they do interact. And certainly from my perspective, that issue of how all of those themes interact specifically in Xinjiang is really, um, I think, opening another avenue for, for further, further research, um, because I think there's certainly a, a great deal of importance to, to those themes and the way in which they've, they've played out in, in to the Chinese context. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I think I did see you on Twitter the other day sketching out a, a, some of that further research. So um, we'll, we'll look forward to We'll look forward to that. Um, let's talk about something again, which is not directly addressed in the book. And, and this is a, a huge topic in its own right. Someone could do a whole book on this, but the international response, the, the, the debates are taking place at various different levels um, from, you know, from the very grassroots to the, you know, the halls of uh, power internationally. Um, some people are seeking avenues via international law. Um, how, how do you rate the international response, and, and particularly since we're um, we're most concerned with um, how this is playing out in Australia? Australia's response so far. I mean, do you do you, um, uh, and and maybe any options that are still on the table that haven't been taken up yet? I, I mean, are there levers that our politicians can can pull on this that um, that they've refrained from? You know, that you you you'd, you'd like to see them. Uh, do how do you yeah so in terms of the international response i mean i think broadly we can frame it as as quite patchy um there has been you know as you, as you noted some isolated unilateral efforts certainly um the u.s government um certainly under the trump administration and now under the biden administration uh has attempted um to establish a framework through which they can sanction individuals and entities uh, associated with uh, the re-education system and also the surveillance 
uh, apparatus in Xinjiang through the Uyghur Human Rights uh, Policy Act um, and also more recently the Uyghur uh, Forced Labour Act uh, as well. So there's there been those kind of examples of individual governments uh, taking particular actions. But I think the biggest, um, and really this is no surprise, the biggest lack of movement really or failure has been at the multilateral level. Um, and, and really for you know students of IR, that's really not a surprise given A, the, the controversial nature of the issue, but also uh, the this, this serious you know, coordination uh, issues that always arise in this context with getting individual sovereign states uh, to assume a common stance on a particular issue, regardless of how pressing or, or controversial it is. Um, in terms of civil society as well, there's been a range of civil society uh, advocacy and, and activism around particular issues to do with Xinjiang. You know, one with respect to the, to the forced labour issue, um, the connection of international supply chains with respect to gar the garment and apparel industry, for instance, has, has been a particularly noteworthy one. So there have been very positive developments on, on that level. But I think the biggest disappointment, certainly from those, I think, who... Uh, uh, that I think, speaking for most of, the, of all the contributors in the book who would like to see global action uh, on this, has really been at the multilateral level, um, and, and in some ways, some of that is an insoluble uh, kind of kind of kind of dilemma. So, in terms of thinking about what Australia's response has been and what Australia could or should be doing, um, I think the Australian response um, to date has has generally followed the lead of the United States. Uh, and this is not really a criticism in, in the sense that, again, in sort of a very, uh, a very sort of realist understanding of international politics, this is really only to be expected. It's one thing for the United States as a, a powerful uh, actor uh, in the international system to sort of unilaterally take action. It's another for a state uh, such as Australia uh, to do so. so in, in that sense, it makes sense for Australia to work with the so-called like-minded actors, um, Canada, the UK, Japan, and a number of other states, uh, to pursue um, action on this. Um, most interestingly, I think, is or has been Australia's version or, or, or amendment to um, the Autonomous Sanctions Bill um, that took place late last year, I think, um, which sets out a number of thematic areas um, uh, in which um, the foreign minister can, in fact, designate individuals and entities to be sanctioned under. And, and there's a list of five of those areas, um, two of which are relevant to Xinjiang, and that is violations or abuse of human rights and uh, also violations of international humanitarian law. So under the, that amendment, there is scope uh, for the Australian foreign minister uh, and indeed the Australian government to take action. Um, I think it remains to be seen what actions will be taken there. Uh, I know in the US case, um, there has been action taken, for instance, against particular entities such as the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps that is known, of course, to run a number of detention facilities, uh, actions taken uh, against the, inter the intersection between the Chinese state and some of the Chinese tech companies that supply the surveillance uh, apparatus in Xinjiang. So there are a number of those avenues that could be explored um, by the Australian government. Um, on the question of uh, international law in particular, I was going to ask you about the question of genocide. Uh, it's been at the centre of a lot of discussion in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, I would say it's sort of risen to, to, to prominence. Mm -hmm. um, people in the book, uh, some make use of it, some, uh, some don't. They, there's, there's a bit of discussion about the various different definitions um, and um, where, where people feel comfortable um, applying the term. Do you want to say something about that? And I might also just start to bring in some of the questions from the Q&A because one of the questions relates to this. Um, this is... Um, and remind people, if you have questions, please do put them, start putting them into the Q&A. Uh, just a comment in the Q&A box says, uh, well, the surveillance applies to everyone. Most of the police at the ground level are, are local. So, you know, how, um, how does that fit with the definition of, of genocide? This is uh, the question that, that's coming in. So maybe if you could work that into your um, response sure. as well. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just speak first to, to the, the question about um, the use of or, or not use of uh, genocide in, in the book and then go to that to that comment um, from, from, from the audience. So in terms of um, the use of genocide or, or not within by, by contributors within the book, we don't have a, a set position as, as David sort of alluded to. Um, I think the key issue uh, for some of us is really thinking about the distinction between its use uh, under international law and perhaps its use within uh, a scholarly context or uh, and, and the different uh, utility of both of those understandings. So in terms of under international law, it's fairly, fairly clear. Um, there's a high threshold uh, for acts to be considered acts of, acts of genocide uh, under the UN Genocide Convention of 1948. So in particular, Article 2 sort of sets out um, this in fairly clear detail, killing members of the group, causing bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting uh, conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction, imposing measures intended to prevent births and forcibly transferring children uh, of one group to another group. So in that context, I note in my introductory framing chapter that uh, the evidence that we have uh, from Xinjiang it can be placed in uh, various aspects of that definition. Um, however, the key issue really is really points uh, Article 2C, which is the, the issue of deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction and whole apart. And this is where international law sets the, the threshold quite high. Now, in terms of the case in Xinjiang, you know, there is of course, a matter of debate here about this issue of intent, uh, about how we can, in fact, identify whether or not this is a deliberate set of measures uh, to bring about physical destruction and whole apart. And this is where um, I think certainly uh, myself and, and others have, have made this argument that the <coughs> descriptively it makes more sense to, to talk about the concept of cultural genocide, particularly in the way in which Raphael Lemkin, uh, the, the original coiner of, of the term genocide, uh, understood it. Uh, so, so for Lemkin, uh, he talks about genocide as having a number of phases, destruction of the national pattern of an oppressed group and the imposition of the national pattern of an oppressor. So the reason why this appeals certainly to me uh, in the context of um, some of those bigger themes that have intersected in Xinjiang is really around this issue of colonialism and settler colonialism and how uh, Lemkin's notion of cultural genocide fits there. Uh, and in particular, it goes to previous um, uh, examples <laughs> or precedents, if you will, in global history that we can talk about. I mean, some have spoken uh, about parallels to um, the treatment of uh, Native, Amer Native Americans uh, during the expansion of the United States, for instance. Or we could also talk about uh, the Australian government's treatment of our own Indigenous peoples um, since white settlement, uh, where there are a number of themes that are, that are clearly parallel to this. So removal of populations from territories, concentration of those populations on reservations or missions and so on, removal of children uh, and educating them in the, in the, uh, the language and cultural norms of the dominant uh, settler uh, culture. So that's kind of where my thinking sits with respect to the issue of genocide. I, I find the cultural genocide frame more useful, certainly in that descriptive sense, uh, uh, to give us an idea of, of making better sense of this. So in terms of that question for, from the floor about well, um, the, the individuals who police this uh, are often Uyghur and this, this means that it can't be genocide. I think as Darren Byler's chapter in, in the book uh, makes out is that that kind of ignores um, really the, the structural violence, if you will, um, that is really at the heart of this. And we're, we're not talking about just the imposition of this system of mass detention and surveillance uh, alone, sort of standing alone in a vacuum. Rather, it's it's really the culmination in some ways of many decades worth of state policy um, going back for, for a considerable period of time. 
Um, and James Liebold has done uh, some work on this elsewhere that's been published uh, a number of years ago, looking at the recruitment of ethnic minorities into the police force as a means of expanding the police force. There's also been uh, further evidence of the transfer and recruitment of primarily Han Chinese police from other regions of Xinjiang into the Xinjiang uh, public security forces as well. So I don't think we can simply say, oh, because some of the police are Uyghur, this means that this can't be uh, can't be a form of, of genocide or cultural genocide. And again, if we look at you know, various precedents that have parallels throughout history, there are, of course, examples of uh, particular groups that were being persecuted that had a role in the persecution of their own population. So there is a whole uh, series of issues here um, that makes, I think, that 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 notion um, untenable. Mm. And I mean, you're very right to point to Darren's chapter on that, which I think is really the first sort of illustration I've seen of the um, the uh, the consequences of working within that system for people who are, you know, initially not really aware of the the full extent of what is going on and what they're uh, what they're about to be involved in. And then uh, in some cases, obviously, uh, at least traumatised um, through that experience. The, we, we've got maybe another five minutes for, for us. I might just combine the last couple of questions I was going to ask um, into, into one because they're both sort of about the, the future. Um, the book talks about, the title talks about the consequences um, of this. And there's, there's certainly discussion about the immediate consequences that we can observe um, now, both inside and outside um, Xinjiang. Have you, in the course of working on this book in discussions, thought more about, you know, the, the medium to long-term consequences, what, um, what uh, you know, what the sort of, um, ideal endpoint of this this campaign looks like from the party's point of view. What what Xinjiang uh, might look like at that at that point, and then I mean because you know we don't want to um, present this all as a fait accompli. Do you see any shifts in uh, the uh, the direction of things that um, might <coughs> be leading to some? Um, uh, softening on certain points of policy? Is there any sign of any step down, uh, any reflection at all uh, within the, um, the party? Um, what would, what would a, a step down look like uh, if it were to, uh, to take place? Yeah, um, so I actually might sort of take that last question first, if you don't, don't mm. mind, David, and then, and then I'll circle sure. back to, yeah. to the issue of, you know, um, consequences. Um, so in terms of that, that that last question about, you know, what does a step down look like or have we seen modifications of, of policy? I mean, I think, um, you know, we what would that step down look like? I mean, certainly from an external observer's perspective, you would like to see the winding down, uh, if not um, the, the eradication of the re-education system uh, and an easing of the surveillance state uh, in Xinjiang. Um, in that sense, we've not seen any moves on that front. And, and certainly if you look at official statements, you know, uh, Xi Jinping at the last Xinjiang work forum was pretty clear. And he said um, the, the party's approach in Xinjiang has been 100% correct and that it would continue. So the party itself sees um, the approach that it's taken in Xinjiang as successful. Um, therefore, I don't. there is very little incentive, certainly as long as Xi Jinping remains uh, chairman of the CCP and president of China that we'll see a, a back down, I think. Um, yet that's not to say there hasn't been any change. There's been modifications to, to the system. Um, so, for instance, I noted uh, earlier on, there's been this adaptation of some elements of the system over time. Uh, certainly in the last year or so, there's been evidence that there's been less people detained in the re-education system, more funneled through uh, the so-called regular uh, prison system, um, as well as uh, the connection to forced or, or coer coerced labour. 
Um, so I think there is overall, and again, this is, you know, I don't have definitive evidence of this, it's just an hypothesis here, is that given the fact that the party views what it's done in Xinjiang as successful, um, that what we might be seeing is really an institutionalisation of the re-education system writ large as one of the planks, key planks of the governance of Xinjiang uh, moving, moving forward. And so this really sort of gets me to that issue of long-term con- or medium and, and long-term consequences. Um, so here we can talk about consequences for Xinjiang itself, consequences more broadly for China, and, and then consequences at the international level. So in terms of Xinjiang, one is this institutionalisation of the education system itself as, as a key plank of, of governance. Um, the other is what seems to be the institutionalisation of the surveillance state itself is kind of an enduring part of uh, the party's approach to governance in the region. In terms of China, we can think here about potential transfer of elements of that Xinjiang model to other regions, provinces, or even issues. Um, There was some uh, evidence uh, last year about the sort of bleeding over of elements of the anti-religious uh, approach in Xinjiang to uh, Hui areas and in other parts of China, a removal of, of minarets, minarets from mosques, removal of Arabic script and so on. So there are elements that could bleed over, uh, certainly within ethnic minority uh, governance. I think the other big issue in terms of long-term consequences for China is, is what this says about um, the centrality of so-called top-level design of of, you know, uh, prioritise the areas of, of governance. So as the, uh, the spate of, of document leaks, the Xinjiang cables and so on demonstrates is that Xi Jinping and other top leaders uh, have very much directed um, uh, the, the, uh, the policy approach in Xinjiang. Uh, and what does this tell us about, you know, the nature of the relationship uh, between Xinjiang and, and the centre, what does it tell us about the nature of the Chinese Communist Party as well uh, moving forward? Finally, in terms of uh, international politics, I think um, Xinjiang or the Xinjiang issue has certainly become in some senses a, a battlefield in this so-called new Cold War between China and, and the United States. You, know, you only have to look at, I suppose, the du- dueling uh, narratives um, that have been pushed out uh, by the United States uh, and, and China on, on this. And certainly on that latter score, you know, China has gone on uh, uh, really on the front foot uh, here, certainly over the last two years, being very proactive and actively promoting um, the, the policies that it has uh, implemented in Xinjiang. So again, really aligning up with, you know, Xi's claim that this uh, approach has been successful, sort of saying to the rest of the world, look, we've um, we've been able to solve uh, our, certainly framed in the context of counterterrorism, you know, we've come up with means and instruments with which uh, we can achieve breakthroughs in, in that context. Uh, and the final consequence, I think, it's really more of a comment, is, is really about the, the long shadow that 9-11 uh, and the war on terrorism casts over a lot of this, not just simply in terms of the way in which China has justified some of what it's done in Xinjiang, but also the way in which this has played out into really sort of a, sort of a bifurcation of international debate and, and sort of positions on, 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 on Xinjiang. All right. Thank you for those um, very thoughtful responses. We're going to go down to a few questions from the the audience and um again please do keep the questions coming in if you if you have things you'd like us to to get to and and michael um i might throw things to you if you we, we've only got you know 10 minutes or so so feel free to just you know um pass on them if there's um we don't have much to, I, I thought i'd begin with the the last one that's just come in and it's a it's a pretty sort of um uh it's a question about policy shift in Xinjiang, the, the replacement of the party secretary uh, in mm. Xinjiang recently. Um, this, the, the governor of Guangzhou, um, Ma Xingrei, is now uh, in, that, uh, in that slot. Do you have a, a take on that, um, what that signifies at all? Yes. I mean, it's certainly an interesting, interesting shift. So removing Chen Chengguo um, 
who I think I think most people, certainly most researchers and scholars on this, would recognise as one of the architects of uh, the education system in Xinjiang. So some have read that as a positive step, um, and uh, the new uh, the new chairman um, has more of a sort of experience in uh, economics and economic development, uh, and seen as really, uh, I suppose, more of a technocrat. Um, so in some ways. However, I think in the sort of the broader scope of China's approach in Xinjiang is that that's fairly consistent with the broad thrust. So if we look at re-education, surveillance apparatus, as well as these notions of, of forced labour, is the ultimate purpose, certainly in the way in which the party speaks about this, is to achieve the development of Xinjiang, so to overcome underdevelopment uh, in particular. So this is in a number of key policy documents, um, 2009 white paper on vocational training, for instance, makes an explicit link between the need for re-education, Uyghur identity, and uh, overcoming underdevelopment. So in that sense, the appointment of a, of a technocrat with experience uh, in that sense makes, makes, uh, makes sense. There's, there's a question that's come in about the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, now, I don't know what your perspective is. I remember when things first started deteriorating 2017, 2018, there was a lot of talk about how this was all about the Belt and Road. Um, from China's point of view, um, you also have talk about the, you know, the Western focus on Xinjiang is all about some counter strategy to the Belt and Road, this, this kind of thing. My sense is that the discussion in relation to Belt and Road has um, moved to the side a little bit, um, but, and I, I don't think it's a big theme of the book, but maybe what are your thoughts on the, the, the connection here between um, Belt and Road and um, China's strategy towards uh, Central Asian neighbours. Yeah, look, I mean, and, I think, and the Western Western response as well. If you if you want to take that up too. Yeah. Um, so in terms of yeah, the BRI's role here is is, a, is an interesting one. You know, obviously you can go back and say, look, you know, BRI was officially launched uh, 2013 by Xi in, in Kazakhstan, um, and then you have really the I suppose the first moves towards uh, the re-education system in Xinjiang 2014 and early 2015. Um, yet from my perspective, what's interesting, I think if we go back further, is really that 2009 to 2013, 14 period. So 2009, the, the events in a in a Rumchi in July that year are really seeing it's kind of a bit of a watershed moment in the party party's approach. Um, so I think rather than looking at BRI as kind of a, a causal factor here, we, we need to go to go back a little bit little bit further. Um, but then moving to the issue of, you know, the West's response as being a counter to BRI in terms of, you know, hyping, so-called hyping what's happening in Xinjiang, I, I don't particularly buy uh, that line of, line of argument uh, at all. Um, you know, BRI, again, comes down to what we think BRI is actually about uh, now. Of course, there's you know a, a great deal of ink uh, being being wasted uh, over BRI, and some of that by myself <laughs> included as well um, about what it actually is about. You know, it, it tends to be a, quite an amorphous um, set of, of of initiatives. So I don't think we can see uh, you know the, the the highlighting of human rights abuses in Xinjiang as a means of undermining BRI. Um, that's certainly, I think, the Chinese narrative that's come through a number of times, although it has faded a little bit in, in, in recent times. So, again, I'm not entirely convinced um, by that particular argument. There's another question <clears throat> relating to the, the global war on terror and uh, surveillance systems in particular. Um, how do we draw the... And the question is asking about connections, for example, between Afghanistan and, and mm -hmm. Xinjiang. Presumably that could extend to um, Iraq, Xinjiang, um, possibly other. Um, I mean, my sense is that when you look at what Chinese, you know, terrorism scholars are saying, their discourse is very cosmopolitan. They certainly present what they're doing as, as synthesising mm -hmm. um, lessons from from elsewhere and 
uh, so on. So the question is asking, you know, to what extent are these systems things that have been developed and marketed, you know, outside China uh, as well, or even painted um, outside China and, and China is, you know, participating in a global circulation of these sorts of technologies. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, look, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and the issue I suppose is, is really in which direction um, this is, this is traveling. And if we're talking about particular modes of, or, or technologies of surveillance. Um, but I think the broader issue is, is really the, um, uh, the context in which that technology is embedded. Um, so again, you, you sort of noted, you know, if you look at what Chinese CT scholars, officials are saying, it's very much couched in the language really of, you know, post 9-11 Western practices of counterterrorism. And in particular, if you look at um, the so-called Xinjiang model of counterterrorism, which I do in, in the book, it's pretty clear that Chinese scholars see what they're doing in Xinjiang as really an adaptation uh, uh, of Western models uh, and their combination with existing Chinese models of public security and policing. So, for instance, you get, you know, discussion about COIN. Uh, so there's the military, very heavily militarised approach along with these ideas of preventive forms of whether it's policing or, uh, in a sense, uh, community policing, I suppose you might you might frame it. So this is where these connections about, you know, counter radicalization strategies that have been tried in various parts of the Western world, France, the UK, Australia uh, as well. So it, it is this very, um, this interpenetration of global narratives with um, China's own approaches to these issues. But coming back to the technology issue, I think the technology issue has been interesting in the sense, uh, in the way in which Chinese tech companies have become very much involved in supplying uh, the the demand uh, of public security, uh, the public security apparatus in Xinjiang with some of these new technologies. And some of these Chinese companies are in fact leader, leader, world leaders in elements of you know, facial recognition, AI, uh, DNA sequencing, uh, and so on. So there's a, there's, a, there's a real interplay here between that, that, those global trends as well as what's happening in China. And sort of to finish off on that global issue is that there is potential, or ha- there is potential for some of uh, that Xinjiang model to travel um, beyond uh, China's frontiers as well, not just in terms of the export of particular technologies, but also uh, the export of you know the methodology that lies behind it. Uh, if you look at China's cooperation with some of the Central Asian states through this uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for instance. There's clear linkages between China's uh, ability to train hundreds of Central Asian police and CT officials in China uh, with their particular approach to, to counterterrorism. So there is that potential for some of this to travel. I might um, wrap things up there and, and throw back to Amy in a second. There were a couple of other questions um, in the box um, that were more sort of <clears throat> asking for more information, factual information about particular aspects of things. People who put those questions in the box, um, please feel free to write to either Michael or, or myself and um, we'll, be, um, we'll be happy to get back to you about that. Uh, thank you all very much for, for being here today and taking an interest in what is still a very dire situation for uh, Uyghurs and other uh, non-Han peoples uh, of Xinjiang. Uh, this book is a really important contribution to our uh, understanding of that. Um, so with that, I will um, now turn the floor back over to uh, Amy, who will uh, say a few uh, closing words and then uh, end the meeting. So thank you again, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Professor Michael Clark and Dr. David Brophy for today's discussion. Members of the audience will be sending an email to everyone here asking for your thoughts on how this webinar went. If you could please fill out that feedback form, we'd really appreciate it so that we can make future UTS ACRI events a better experience for everyone involved. As previously mentioned, Professor Clark's new book is now available. If you'd like to delve deeper into this topic, um, information will now be made available on your screen. 
If you wanted to know more about the Australia-China relationship and about our research, more details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org. The discussion today will also be there. Please follow us on Twitter for the latest news at ACRI underscore UTS. Thanks again to our speakers and all our attendees. See you next time.